And welcome in, folks, to yet another edition of Open Mic Night. I am your host, Noah Taluki, and on today's episode, we're going to break down the 41-21 to unfortunate loss to the Indianapolis Colts for the Lions and the secret weapon that the Lions might have, Everson Griffin. What does his signing mean at the free agency deadline? What does it mean moving forward for this Lions team? Also, Michigan-Michigan State game. What a thriller that was. Michigan State upsetting Michigan 27-24 in Ann Arbor. I have a statement for some Michigan fans out there that might believe in this team. And what does this loss mean for Jim Harbaugh heading into next season since his contract is still up in the air? Also, Tigers making a big, big signing in A.J. Hinch as the next manager for the Tigers. How will he help this young roster out with all the prospects? And joining us later, we will talk with Jake Biding, who was the former strength and conditioning coach for the Houston Astros when they won their World Series in 2017. He worked a lot with the prospects over there and A.J. Hinch and all them, so it's going to be interesting to hear his take on how good A.J. Hinch can be in a Tiger uniform. So I kind of wanted to switch things up a little bit today. I know we've been focusing a lot on the Lions lately, but trying to get some other sports in there, college football, Tigers, a lot of big topics, kind of want to mix it up for you today. So I really hope uh, you enjoy this one. Hopefully everybody had a great Halloween weekend and enjoyed a lot of the treats, the candy, the trick-or-treating, all that. And unfortunately, the Lions did not really help with the festivities this weekend as they lost 41-21 to to the Indianapolis Colts. And the Colts just really imposed their will, scoring over 20 points in the second quarter and in the fourth quarter. When you look at where this team was last week, you know, winners of two straight, kind of had some momentum, 3-3, three and three, 500, you'd think that They'd play a little bit better than they did against the Colts, but unfortunately, just they just got absolutely destroyed. I, I mean, it just seemed like there were points in the game where the Lions just gave up, you know. And they started out fast as they always do, you know, the touchdown to Marvin Jones that that Stafford threw, and I kind of thought the Lions might have a shot. But you know what lost them the game, in my opinion? What I saw was the line. The offensive line, for some reason, could not block against the run, and we've seen it. The last few weeks, the Lions have kind of gotten a little bit of run game going, you know, especially evident against Jacksonville when they were able to ground and pound and DeAndre Swift rushed for over 100 yards. The offensive line overall this season has been okay. You know, it's been decent, but they were awful yesterday. I mean, they were allowing Stafford to get sacked on multiple occasions. And one thing about the offensive line that I noticed, where is Tyrell Crosby? Why wasn't he in the game at right tackle? Why did they switch Vitae to right tackle, and then they put Joe Dahl in at right guard? I mean, where did this come from? The combination, in all offseason, they were trying to think about what to do on the offensive line, especially with the loss of Graham Glasgow and all that. They were tinkering with the offensive line. Vitae was out for the first couple weeks. Then they started to really kind of get going a little bit once they got Vitae back. Now, I don't know why Tyrell Crosby, because he was actually having a good year at right tackle. Where was he? I didn't see him on the injury report. Why did they put Joe Dahl in? I'm not saying that contributed to the loss or anything, but I'm just wondering why the Lions did that. Just an observation that I saw during the game that I thought could have played a part. Another observation. Good teams find ways to win. This was a winnable game for the Lions, I think. I think if the Lions were able to get pressure on the quarterback, Phillip Rivers, 39 years old, which they did a little bit here and there, but he was scrambling out of the pocket like he was 25 years old in his prime. You know, if they got a little more pressure on him and we were able to not give up in certain situations or not lay down like Danny Shelton's penalty, stupid. In my opinion, that was the turning point of the game. The Lions were playing pretty well defensively up to that point. And then they were tied 7-7 to with about seven minutes left in the second quarter. You know, they get a big third down sack, and the Lions need a score on the ensuing drive, but it's snuffed out because of the Danny Shelton penalty. Unnecessary roughness. Looked like he was kind of taunting the other guys, kind of got in a little skirmish after the sack. You don't need that. Sort of similar to the Jamie Collins play where he got ejected when he headbutted the ref. I mean, just things like this that are stupid and unnecessary. We don't need this. We are trying to win a football game. We don't need extracurricular activities. And I was screaming at the TV, we do not need this. Why are you trying to get into skirmishes and fights? Please. 
I think that kind of snuffed a little bit of momentum out of the Lions, and the Colts took full advantage. They scored easily a couple plays later, and the Lions just played catch-up the rest of the game. So that might have take, took a little bit out of us. I'm not saying that you know it was completely the reason we lost, but I think it did take sap a little bit of energy out of us. Anyways, Lions move on from that, play Minnesota. I think they can win that game, but they got Everson Griffin now. Last week we recorded just before the news broke, and I'm ecstatic. I think this is a great move. I get how he's 32, I believe, but this is definitely going to add some help in the pass rush. We need some help. Trey Flowers can't do everything. We need some help on the other side. He's cleared to play this week against his old team. He's going to be juiced up. He's going to be ready to go, and I think this could help play to a Lions victory. So I'm really excited about this. I'm glad Bob Quinn only gave up a six-round pick. This basically costs the Lions nothing. This only helps. This doesn't hurt. I am looking forward to seeing how Everson Griffin fits in the Honolulu Blue and Silver. Give us a little bit more pass rush. The next few weeks should be wins. They should beat Minnesota. They should beat Washington. Carolina could be a little toss-up, but... They should take care of business. They should go to 5-4. and four. I'm not giving up on this season, folks. I think the Lions still have a little bit of a shot. But overall, bad loss against the Colts. We move on, and we take care of our mistakes. Because I know the Lions can play better than that. I know they can. And I'm also hoping Kenny Galladay is okay. It seems like he might be hurt. His status for next week against Minnesota is up in the air. Lions are working out a couple receivers. This offense is definitely different without Kenny Galladay, but there has to be guys that can step up. I mean, Marvin Hall, I thought, did a nice job stepping up when Kenny was absent. They targeted TJ Hawkinson more, which I really like. I talked about it in previous episodes how they really need to start targeting TJ more in order to be successful. I liked how they were doing that more. So they just need guys to step up. It's crunch time. We're already about halfway through the season. It's go time. All right, so Lions aside, Michigan, Michigan State. Now, me as a fan, I don't necessarily watch a lot of college football. But when I do, I get excited, and especially if it's Michigan or Michigan State. I consider myself a neutral fan of football. So Michigan, I'm half with. Michigan State, I'm half with in terms of football. Not really a real allegiance to either one of them. But for basketball, I lean towards Michigan State. We'll get more into them in later episodes when the season starts up. But anyways, to me, Saturday's game makes me think, how can I give any support to this Michigan football program? I am all about both teams being good at the same time, creating a true rivalry game, kind of like what we saw in 2015 with the bad snap punt. That was a game that deserved so much hype because both teams were very, very good. I want the rivalry to be like that. That's what I want Michigan to be. But Michigan, you see it with the media here. They never, never seem to criticize Michigan. And I've never understood that. I've never understood that from being a neutral fan all this time. Why nobody's calling for Jim Harbaugh's job in the Detroit media. I wonder that. And they always seem to bash Michigan State about all kinds of different things. But then, oh, we'll just sweep everything under the rug with Michigan. Because Michigan is the leaders of the West Hail to the victors! How dare you criticize the Block M! They just can't play well in big games. They can't play well in rivalry games. This is a Michigan State team that lost badly to Rutgers under a first-year head coach in Mel Tucker who barely had an offseason with his team. Ragtag group of guys left over from Mark D'Antonio starting to create his own culture. And Michigan loses to him? And this is Jim Harbaugh's sixth season as Michigan head coach. No more losing to rivals. No more losing, especially to teams that you definitely should beat. This is unacceptable in year six. And if they played like that against Michigan State, there's no way they're beating Ohio State. None. And in college football, it is so important to beat your rivals. That's the thing a lot of people don't understand. It's very, very important to beat rivals. And if you don't beat rivals in big-time college football, you are going to be gone. And what has... Jim Harbaugh done against Michigan State and Ohio State, the two biggest rivals for Michigan. He hasn't beaten Ohio State. In the years that he's beat Michigan State, Michigan State hasn't really been their best. This year, they definitely weren't at their best, and they still lost. You know, it just kind of makes me think. Just some of the arrogance. You know, oh, Joe Milton is the savior. It's one game. He barely threw many long passes. He throws out to the flat. 
you praise him. You already say that he's a Heisman Trophy winner. You already say Michigan is going to the national championship. We're going to win the Big Ten. We're going to beat Ohio State. It's one game. And the media buys into it. Look at the halftime show. Look at Joel Klatt on the broadcast. I could hear it myself. I was taking notes in my notebook during the game about all this. Michigan State was winning at halftime. The broadcast on the halftime show was all about Michigan. Michigan. Oh, Michigan. Charles Woodson calling Michigan, we, we need to do better with the DBs. Michigan State had the lead. Any credit to Mel Tucker at all? Any credit to Rocky Lombardi playing a great game, throwing the ball on the sidelines and having the receivers go get it, taking advantage of Michigan's weak defensive back play? No. They didn't have any of that. It was all about what Michigan needs to do to win this game and, oh, some of the penalties. Enough. Enough. I don't want to hear that. I'm kind of tired of this media just feeding on this. Feeding on Michigan. Thinking that they're the leaders and the best all the time. They're not really an elite program anymore. Sure, they have the greatest, the most wins of all time in college football. The present is what matters. And everything, even what Joel Klatt was saying, everything was about Michigan. They talk about that completed pass to the freshman receiver White, I believe. And Joel Klatt is saying, oh, why is that... Rule to catch. That is clearly an incomplete pass. Well, look at the replay, Joel. It was clearly a catch. I don't know why you're bickering about all this. I just didn't like that broadcast with Joel Klatt and all that because they should have been praising Michigan State a little bit more because they were the ones that deserved the credit. Not Don Brown, who seems to fail as defensive coordinator every single big game. Ohio State giving up 60-plus points. Michigan State can't adjust. I mean, they should have had safety help over the top for the adjustments, but they never did that. Rocky Lombardi was running the same exact plays on both sidelines. And completion after completion after big play after big play. And Don Brown did not adjust. We'll see if Harbaugh's back because with losing to Michigan State and probably losing to Ohio State, got to beat the rivals. He's not doing that. I think it's over. I think the Harbaugh experiment is done in Michigan. He's had enough time to get his guys in, to establish his culture. I think the NFL is more suited for him. Maybe he'll take the Jets job. Maybe Adam Gase will be fired there, and he'll go to the NFL and take that Jets. Because obviously, not succeeding at Michigan. We'll have to see, but Michigan has a lot of work to do. Going to Indiana next week, they really, really have to get up on their horse. Because that's a tough and hungry Indiana team. All right, last thing on the agenda before we get to our interview with former strength and conditioning coach for the Houston Astros, Jake Biding. The Lions making a move last week, hiring A.J. Hinch as their next manager. I am all for this. I'm very, very excited for the opportunity for Hinch to come here. He was kind of my guy that I wanted. I was looking at all the other candidates, and I'm thinking, why the heck would they hire Don Kelly? Why are these names even coming up? I mean, I don't want you know these guys that are just fresh out of playing. I want a guy that's been around for a little bit. I know A.J. Hinch played for the Tigers back in the worst season in Tigers history, 2003. But I want a guy that's been around the game for a little bit, has had success, obviously, with Houston. Now, I get the whole cheating scandal, but what I admire about Hinch is that he admitted it. He has put that behind him, and he's ready to go win. And you think, you know, he had that one-year suspension from the MLB. No teams could talk to him until after the World Series. Hinch said that Al Avila called him literally a half hour after the World Series ended. And I listened to his interview that he did with Dan Dickerson on YouTube. I was very impressed with how well A.J. Hinch handled himself, the way he talked, the way he spoke. You could just see that this guy has a plan, and he wants to be here in Detroit. He wants to execute his plan. He knows exactly what to do because he's been on those winning teams before, like the Astros, and he knows how to coach winning baseball. And I thought Dan asked a good question about embracing analytics, but also embracing the human side. Now, that's a big question with MLB managers these days because there's a lot of traditional old-school baseball guys, and then there's guys that really like to embrace the nuances with the analytics, the computerized data, and all, and all that. I liked AJ's answer where it's a real combination of both. Yes, he embraces the analytics, but also embraces that human side where he can put guys into the best situation without having to rely on on analytics and all that. You have to think from the human side of things. I think this is an absolute home run hire for the Tigers, and I expect them to to compete 
for championships in this decade of the 2020s. Perfect hire. Different manager than Ron Gardenhire, but I think he's going to do a great job with these guys, and you never know. What if he starts luring veterans in? That's when the cash could start flowing again for Alavila, paying all the big bucks for all the big-time players. I think guys are going to buy in right away. They know he comes from a winning organization in the Astros. The cheating scandal is behind him. He owned up to it. He admitted it. He apologized publicly. He's going to pour his heart and soul into this because he knows that he is getting a second chance to coach in the MLB, and I expect him to take full advantage of it. And joining us now here on Open Mic Night is Jake Biding, the former Astros strength and conditioning coach from 2013 through 2017. He also spent eight seasons with the Cleveland Indians in their strength and conditioning program. Uh, Jake, thank you so much uh, for joining us here on Open Mic Night. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. All right. So first things first, I wanted to start off with asking you, you know, what made you want to get into this business of strength and conditioning in the MLB anyways? Sure. I, um, yeah, I was just always playing sports, always very into it. I enjoyed the workout part of it a lot, you know, the, the physical preparation for it. Um, and then when I was at John Carroll as a student, I, I was having problems with my meth. I had some injuries. And, and as I was going through like the rehab problem process, I was really getting more um, interested in some of the preventative measures that maybe I could have taken and, you know, just the way the body worked, period. And so I started taking my exercise science classes and then as I was just kind of getting into it, the opportunity presented itself to do an internship with the Indians in their strength conditioning department. So I figured I would uh, I would check it out and see what that was like. Because I wasn't sure exactly what area of exercise science I wanted to go into. And I mean, about a week into the internship, I was pretty hooked on strength and conditioning. So it was uh, it was an easy path for me to follow, especially because I was I was so fortunate to have gotten a good internship at that point. So you mentioned your experience, you know, with the the Indians, and I know you were in the minor leagues over there, and then you transitioned with the Astros, you know, obviously to the major leagues. Talk about mm-hmm. kind of that transition between sort of working more in the minors and the majors. Is there any difference, uh, even at all? Yeah, uh, yes and no, right? I mean, certainly from a physical development standpoint, that you get a lot of people that are in the minor leagues, depending on the level you're working, especially if you get some people that are, you know, the, the young kids that are just signed out of Latin America might be 16 years old. You know, you might get a college kid that went to a big four-year university that's 21 years old, that's much more physically developed. So you, there's kind of a wider range of development, stages of development that you get in the minor leagues. And certainly that's not just physical, that's emotional and, 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 and mental as well, in terms of the maturity and all that. And then in the major leagues, it's a lot different. It's you're less focused on the long-term development of people. You still need to focus on it, but it's a lot more about, you know, first off, you'll, you'll have some older people and all that. And, you know, I, I mean, my last year in the major leagues, we had Carlos Beltran, who was 40, you know, down to Dallas Spring, who was 22 or something like that when, when he was on the team, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide range. But then the, the focus tends to shift of, okay, well, we're not just focused on development, especially when your team's good. It's like, hey, we need to win a game tonight. So what can we do tonight to get ready to win a game? Also with an eye on, hey, how can we make sure our our players are still ready to compete in the playoffs and do all these other things that are a little bit more down the road. So the the, the goals change a little bit, and the the ways you achieve the goals – can certainly be different too. That there's a, there's a lot more resources at the major league level as well. You know, I do, you have an assistant strength coach, and the food's better, and the weight rooms are bigger, and you have visiting weight rooms when you go on the road. So there's some the logistical parts of it that make it certainly a lot easier at the major league level. Minor league level is kind of fun. You get to be real creative. You kind of sink or swim in a lot of ways. So some differences like that too. Right. Right. So what exactly does strength and conditioning entail in the MLB you know, in terms of the programs that you guys do? I know I imagine it's different than maybe like an NFL strength program where you know, focusing more on the brute strength, whereas baseball might be you know, more focused on mobility and, and things like that. So what, what, are, what are those differences and the nuances? You know, so that's a good question. And you know, I, I have never worked in the NFL. I, mean, I worked a bit at the University of South Florida with their football team right when I graduated college. But I will say, from talking to a handful of friends that have spent a number of years in both professional baseball and working in the NFL, they say that the differences in the actual training programs are a lot smaller, particularly in season, than you would think. 
because at the end of the day, the athletes, you know, it's also good for football players to be mobile and things like that. But baseball players also need to be strong, you know, and, and they need to be ready to compete physically at a very high level. And if you look, if you look around the major leagues, especially, there are not a lot of people that are small, you know, that are really, I mean, the guys like Jose Altuve, who, you know, he's five for five, but he's really strong. He's really physically put together. Like, there's not a lot of people that are with really slight builds, particularly the position players. It's a pretty physically robust group. So, you know, you do need to be strong enough. Now, there are certainly some differences, you know, like you wouldn't focus, like you, you're not going to do heavy bench pressing. Some of the things around the shoulders, you know, you don't want to build as much bulk through the upper body, especially. Baseball, because you play every day, you have to really focus on recovery. So there are some people that have said, hey, instead of being called a strength conditioning coach, you should be called a fatigue management specialist. Because that's really what it's about. I, you know, I mentioned earlier that the, one of the differences between the major and the minor leagues is that in the major leagues, you have to get someone ready to play every single night. And that's tough. I mean, that's really hard. And I mean, from the player standpoint, that's hard to be ready to play mentally, certainly physically, every single day. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, sometimes you have to pull back on training intensity a little bit. You know, sometimes you have to pull back on training altogether, right? Like if, if I was planning on working a guy out after a game and that game went 14 innings, well, it's, it's not going to help him to lift after that game, right? So you know, we might do something else for recovery. We might do extra recovery work the next day, push the lift back all together. You know, th- those kind of things are where you get a little bit different. So the, the readiness component of it, you know, which – Again, it's hard because you have to be focused on, you have to be in the moment on what's going to get them ready today or tomorrow to play. And then also long term, like, hey, if I'm putting on this workout today, you know, how much of a price is that going to cost down the road in a month when he still needs to be physically fit and ready to compete in late September or whatever it is when we're making a push to the playoffs? So you got to kind of really try to strike a balance of, pulling back and managing fatigue, but also pushing to maintain the strength and explosiveness and you know, the kind of that physical robustness that you need to make it through an entire season as well. Now, does the program that you do with strength and conditioning, does that vary based on position, you know, pitchers versus infielders or relievers and, and people like that? Uh, sure, yeah. The, the area where you'll see it a lot is, you know, essentially you can say there's three groups on a baseball team, the starting pitchers who only play once every five days, the release pitchers who you never know when they're going to really pitch, and then the position players. And you can really even break down the position players into like your everyday guys and then your, 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 your handful of backup guys that are on the team. So the guys are playing every day. Again, the, the volume of baseball work is so high that it's kind of challenging to do a lot with them. You have to really pick your spots carefully. Whereas, like a starting pitcher, they don't work, you know, on the field anyway. They don't have to go play for four four days after they pitch. So you can really get after. You can get pretty hard. You don't have to worry too much if they're like sore from a workout or anything like that. Whereas, like if I would have, you know, when I was working with the Astros, if I would have pushed George Springer really hard on squats, and so his legs feel super sore the next day. Well that's not good, right? He's, he's got to go play the next day. He's got to run and all those things. I'm, you know, I'm setting him back on the field and risking injury because his muscles are broken down a little bit more. So a lot of the intensities have to vary a little bit. The conditioning varies a lot, right? Like the starting pitchers will do a lot more conditioning. Most of the position players, most of them, get their get all their, their running in during the game, so you really don't even need to do a bunch of extra running. Again, with the, the caveat that the, the backup players, like those are the guys you'd go out and do some sprint work with and things like that. So, yeah, there's, there's differences, but there's also, at the same time, they're all rotational athletes. They do a lot of rotation. They're all throwers. You know, they all need to be explosive in their lower body. They all need to be fairly lean. You know, there's a lot of comp, uh, comparable things, too. And then, you know, you, you know, you do testing and assessments and everything to see what areas they're good at, what areas you need to develop them a little bit more physically to kind of round them out. And so that, that makes for some individual differences as well, you know, based off of kind of where they're at physically, you know, if they have an injury history that's, you know, got a lot of uh, things that might cause them to have some, the way I'm looking for, some, some kind of, you know, issues that might lead to injuries in the future, you know, those, those kind of things. So 
with the Astros, you had the chance to work with uh, two of the best Tigers uh, in this recent decade, uh, J.D. Martinez and then Justin Verlander. Mm-hmm. Of course, J- uh, J.D. Martinez, not many people remember him for his Astro days, uh, more for his Tigers right. and, his a- and his Red Sox days, but you did work with him for a little bit. Verlander also getting traded at the last second, coming over and then just completely revolutionizing his game with the Astros. You know, how come it didn't necessarily work out with J.D. Martinez, but then also Justin Verlander, just right away, you know, he makes an immediate impact with the Astros? Uh, sure. Well, I'll, I'll talk about J.D. first because I, I spent a little bit more time working with him. He was with us throughout 2013. J.D. was always very committed to his work, uh, which is always great. And I know, you know people kind of assume that about professional athletes, that all of them are really committed. And that's not really the case. You know, you got to keep in mind that the, it, sometimes it's hard for people like you and I who were, you know, maybe average or below average athletes growing up to really conceive this. That, But these guys were so good from the moment they came out of the womb that they've never had to work hard, a lot of them. So a lot of them are used to just kind of showing up and being great. And it's hard to flip a switch and when they get into professional ball and for the first time everyone's as good as you are to all of a sudden start working hard and being well planned out. J.D. was definitely one of those ones that that was never an issue for. He was a, he worked hard always. He did a great job with his strength conditioning routines. He, you know, he was very diligent. You know, people actually used to kind of tease him about, like, he had a notebook that he would keep after every at-bat. He'd go write in what the pitcher did and, and all these kind of things. So he was always thinking about it. He was always committed to it. And you know, he just had some fundamentals and technique issues that he needed uh, uh, to work on. He had, he did that over one off season going into the 2014 season. And, you know, unfortunately for the decision for us and with the Astros, the situation that he was in, I believe it was the 2014 season that we released him um, in spring training. Because, you know, they just, he didn't have much of a shot. They, they had kind of decided to move on to some younger outfielders. You know, George Springer was coming up that season and, there were some other younger guys that wanted to give looks, and J.D. had had some playing time. So I put him on waiver, and, you know, as much as the Astros get knocked for releasing him, you know, justifiably, of course, every other major league team had a chance to put him on the 40-man roster, and every other team passed on him, right? So at that time, he was kind of out. And to his credit, instead of, like, pouting about it, um, you know, he took his minor league deal, but the, the Tigers put him on. He really did a great job of taking the counsel of older veteran players. You know, I remember seeing him when we went in to play the Tigers later in the 2014 season, and he was talking about, you know, again, coming from where he came from in Houston, he was on a couple of teams that had lost well over 100 games, had basically no veteran players to kind of help and part with them on and then things like that. You know, he started talking about what it was like to be around Victor Martinez and Miguel Cabrera and how much he was learning from him about being a professional and certainly the X's and O's of the game. And that combined with the improvements to a swing he made and you know, again he was always a guy that was willing to learn and willing to push himself so once he got some of those things ironed out and was in a situation to be successful it really he just took off and it was you know it couldn't be happier for him he's done such a great job and then uh, Verlander obviously had a, a longer track record of success and you know there was uh, never a, a doubt that he was going to be successful with the Astros coming in we have a we had a really great pitching coach in Brent Strom good analytics team who could come in and work with him, you know, make a couple of slight tweaks and that was all he needed. And, you know, again, he's one that you don't have to coach too much. You know, he's, uh, he, he's pretty great. So he, uh, I mean, basically single-handedly won us the American League Championship Series in 2017. He was the MVP of that series. And that, you know, pitched well in the World Series as well. So that was a huge part of us winning it. But, um, but again, another guy just, you know, meeting him late in his career, I only worked with him for two months, but, he was so, his knowledge was so incredible on top of his physical gifts. I mean, I know one of the things that our pitching coach had talked about a lot was just that, hey, he can really execute a game plan well, which I know that sounds basic. That like, hey, if this is the scouting report, do what it says, essentially, right? Like these are weaknesses of the hitters. Can you consistently, if it says this guy can't hit, you know, high and inside fastballs, can you consistently throw high and inside fastballs? And he, he did that incredibly well, right? He did whatever, he could execute a scouting report well. I mean, he had the tools in terms of different pitches and then the ability to do it consistently, to do it in pressure situations. And certainly his pitches are above average pitches as well. That, that doesn't hurt. But he, um, again, does the little things well to prepare himself and then can execute 
in really high tension situations, which is not everybody can do. So the big news coming from last week in Detroit is that they hired A.J. Hinch to be their manager, replacing Ron Gardenhire. You worked with A.J. Hinch for three seasons, I believe, from 2015 to 2017. What was it like working with him you know, on a daily basis, and will he be a good fit with the Tiger organization with all that young talent that's on the roster? Oh, absolutely, yeah. He's uh, A.J.'s great manager, um, and I mean, really the, one of the things that's impressive about A.J. is that he'll – be a good fit with any roster that he works with. Um, he, you know, he can work with a group of very young players. He can work with a group of incredibly veteran players because he's done it, you know, in his different managerial situations, both in Houston and Arizona. And so, uh, you know, one of his strengths is, you know, he's very smart. He's an excellent communicator, but he's also been in a lot of different roles. You know, I mean, he can, you know, he, he can connect with the players on a player-to-player level because, you know, he did play. Uh, he has a significant playing career in the major leagues. He's been a front office member. Yeah, so he can communicate well with the front office. Obviously, he's been a manager, so he understands the coaching staff side of things. You know, I mean, that's one of his great strengths. So he is that he can really he, – he just, he, he, again, he's a very gifted communicator and, and, and very intelligent, very well-prepared. So he can really – communicate with any group, you know, where, where the player's from and find ways to connect. And, you know, and he's just, uh, yeah, he, he's only great for me. Really, it's, uh, from the little bit I know about where the Tigers are at right now as an organization, it seems like it's fairly comparable to what he was coming into in 2015 with us in Houston. So, yeah, I mean, being able to help get some of these players across the line, across the finish line developmentally, yeah, he'll be, he'll be great with doing that. He works really well with the staff. So, you know, it's a great hire by the Tigers. I think they'll really, they'll really benefit from it. So it's known out there that the Astros really like to embrace the analytics uh, side of the game, you know, in, in a lot of phases, and including uh, even down to you in strength and conditioning. How can analytics, you know, help a team, but also can it hurt a team as well? Or how do you balance uh, both the human side of things and the analytics? Sure. You know, I think a lot of the... Yeah, and I'll speak mainly to strength and conditioning here, though, just because that's the area that I, I, I know the best, certainly. The big thing is, to me, is involving people in the process, right? Explaining what you're doing, you know, why you're using the numbers, how they can help people. You know, like if you're dealing with players, they're under so much pressure. They have such a finite timeline to, to be in the major leagues. You know, it's, it's very much you could have one opportunity and then – if it doesn't go well, you're gone. You never get another shot. And even if you're a great, great player, I mean, getting, beginning to play five years in the major league is, is incredible, right? There's not a lot of people that have done that. And so they have this very finite window, right? So they want to know, what can you do to help me? How is this information going to help me? So, again, talking about strength conditioning, if you're having me do these tests, why? Like, what, how's it going to help? You know, so being able to explain what you're doing clearly, show them that you're there to help them with this information, show how the information is validated. That's a big part of it as well. But, you know, where's the back on this? Where's this information coming from? You know, are you using this new piece of testing equipment because it, it, it's, it's been proven to work with baseball players or because it's just new and it's cool and you just want to play around with it, right? Am I getting paid for you? Or are you really doing something that's going to help take me to the next level? You know, I talked earlier about how, at the major league level, there's not as much physical development left. Uh, you know, guys are grown. You don't, you're not necessarily trying to add 10 pounds of muscle mass there every year. Like maybe you are when a player's a teenager or in their early 20s. So you have to find these ways to really refine their physical development. And so using some of these uh, you know, more advanced technologies can really be a way, a way that you know, produce a lot of numbers and a lot of data can really be ways to help fine tune a, you know, someone like, Justin Verlander or J.D. Martinez, who's you know already a grown man and physically developed, and you're just trying to tweak what they're doing just a little bit, right? And having you know a very specific reason why it it can really help build buy-in, and again help you fine tune your your training as a for me as a strength conditioning coach. Last question for you, Jake. You had experience mm-hmm. working, you know, obviously with the Astros when they were really at the bottom of the barrel, if you will, in the MLB. But mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, by the end of your time with the Astros. They were on top, World Series champions. Talk about sort of that experience going from the worst of the worst to the best of the best, worst to first, if you will, because we see a very similar situation in Detroit. 
AJ Hinch, same sort of situation in, in the, with the Astros, transitioning over to Detroit. Talk about that process and what it's like to, you know, go through being worst and then going up to first. Yeah, uh, it's uh, jarring. I would say to go to have that big of a transition, and there was a fifty win differential from my first to the last regular season. We were fifty one and one hundred and eleven my first year, and we were one hundred and one and 61 my last year in the regular season. So, obviously, you know, we were more talented, um, certainly. But we, we had Jose Alcubre. We had Dallas Keuchel. You know, George Springer was in the organization. You know, Marlon Gonzalez was on our team. You know, both years. So, there's, there's a lot of the same guys. You know, and again, of course, we, we added more talent, right? That contributed to our increase in the win totals. But, I, you know, I think one of the things that AJ really helped with was being able to, you know, instill confidence in, in in those guys, and certainly help their development and all that. But, you know, help them with learning about how do you need to prepare to be more competitive at the major league level, to be consistently a winner, because it's it, it, it's hard to come out of, right? It's hard to come out of like being really bad. And then we were, you know, my second year we won seventy games, I think, or seventy one games. Yeah, you know, we made a significant improvement, but we were still pretty bad. We were still pretty far far away from the playoffs. And my third year when AJ came in, we won another sixteen games, made the wild card, won the wild card game and and we're in the division series. Um but a lot of that was just getting guys to believe that hey, you can do this. Um it helps too to bring in. Yeah, you know, there's a point where usually when a, a team is young and up and coming, where you, you sign some veteran players that can help out. You know, you know, in 2015 for us, that was you know we, we had a handful of relievers that we had signed. Um, Jed Myler we had signed to play in field, and so just you get some more veteran voices in there to help. You know, some of the young guys. You know, with you know, kind of like the comparison I made with JD earlier, some of the the mental side of things and. You know, certainly in 2017, bringing in guys like Josh Reddick and Brian McCann and Carlos Beltran took us to a whole other level of that. Um, but that it changes the composition in a really good way because you get the young energy and kind of the big talents. From you know, for us, it was Altuve and Springer and Correa and Bregman and all these guys. And then getting in the more veteran guys, they're still you know good contributors. You know, still incredibly consistent. That's a huge part at the major league levels, being being really consistent every day because you got to play 162 games. You know, those things are, are really important. And um, it, it just it's a shift, right? Again, it's a shift from for me. I noticed that if in some ways, in some ways, my first season in the big leagues was kind of like we were. I mean, we, there were no expectations for us to be good. It was, you know, it was pretty clear that we were probably going to be, if not the worst team in the major leagues, one of. So I could still kind of focus more long term on their development. I didn't have to worry as much about let's make sure we're ready for September to win and you know to win in the playoffs. So yeah, there were some shifts like that that you know as a coach you have to make, but certainly the players do as well. And so it's uh, yeah, it's a lot of differences, but it's yeah, you know, it's fun. It, 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 it was it was a big gradual for us over three years, but the, the veteran player influence was a, was a really big part of that. And again. You know, having a you know AJ's first year, he brought in a great coaching staff as well. Again, you know Brett Strom being there and as a pitching coach, Trey Hillman as a bench coach. There were a lot of uh, again a lot of coaches that were very well equipped to help with that transition as well. Jake Biding, former Astros strength and conditioning coach from 2013 through 2017. Uh, thank you again, Jake, for joining us here on Open Mic Night. Absolutely, thanks for coming on. And thanks again to Jake Biding for giving us a unique perspective on A.J. Hinch and the behind-the-scenes side of the MLB, which is strength and conditioning. Great insight there. He's a teacher of mine here at John Carroll. I actually got to try on his World Series ring once after class. He brought it in. He says, Noah, check this out. And I was like, wow, this is the same ring that my favorite player, Justin Verlander, is wearing as well. So it was awesome to see that ring and get to put on a world championship bling. Hopefully Lions will win next week against the Vikings. Michigan has to get it together now before Jim Harbaugh is out of here and A.J. Hinch going to be a stellar Tiger manager. I expect the best from him and everybody who wears the old English D. Join us next week for another edition of Open Mic Night.
right here on the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Check out all of their awesome and amazing content that they have to offer. And I hope everybody has a great week and go Lions!